This is Vanessa with the latest Tazian news, and here they are. Indonesia ambassador to China praises China on third international import expo. Indonesian ambassador to China, Jauhari Orat Mangun, spoke highly of the ongoing third China International Imports Expo when he serves as a live streamer selling Indonesian goods. Orat Mangun believes that, as a major coffee producer in the world, Indonesia has a variety of coffee flavors, which promise broader markets for sure. Because we are, we are one of the best coffee producing countries, we have all kinds of coffees, and Indonesia consists of seven, more than 17,000 islands. So each island, they have their own taste. If you want to have the best coffee, you can come and taste Indonesian coffee. The ambassador enjoys in the live streaming promotion and tastes the exhibited food products all the way. Seeing an old Indonesian paper company also appearing at the import expo, he felt very impressed that the paper towels used by every household in Indonesia is now also available in the Chinese market. Yes, I'm using since since I was in Indonesia and now here, so uh, very good products. Now we would like, because we are using Indonesia, we know that this is the best product, so we would like to see that more and more uh, people here in China using the best product from Indonesia. Orat Mangun also says that he felt very grateful to China for holding a mega event like the Import Expo. Through the international platform, the best Indonesian goods can land in the Chinese market. More importantly, the trade platform of China International Import Expo also pumps up the recovery of the world economy. CIIE, the third CIIE, play a catalytic role as well in which it can uh, uh, generate or stimulus uh, the, the recover of the uh, global economy, in particular in the trade area. So this is one of the special moments, golden momentum to all of us participating countries as well at the third CIIE. Coffee has become part of life in Indonesia. These products win a high reputation amongst consumers. The third China International Import Expo is heating up in Shanghai. China, Japan and South Korea work together in trade cooperation. During a TV forum with the China Global Television Network, expert says cooperation among China, Japan and South Korea adds certainty to global growth and both countries are speeding up negotiations for a free trade agreement. Through the responses to COVID-19, China, Japan and South Korea have set an example for regional cooperation. Kyung Jung, executive dean of Fanghai International School of Finance of Fudan University says that in such an uncertain world, people need to focus on what's certain. What's certain out there is that China Japan and South Korea, among other Asian nations, um, have basically put the COVID-19 virus under control and the economies are recovering. If you look beyond Asia, there's a lot of uncertainties in US and Europe. So really, if you lo look around the world, the only certain thing about economic recovery is, in, is located in Asia. Cooperation, more trading activities among the three nations and also with other Asian economies is not only important for these countries, but it's increasingly very important and crucial for the global economy. That is, the growth in China, the growth in uh, South Korea and in Japan, separately and together, through these linkages, will not only help the Asian region to grow this year and beyond, but it's also the most important force that's gonna drive the global economy to recover this year and beyond. The three countries have strengthened their cooperations to overcome the economic, including pushing forward negotiations on free trade agreements, such as Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, a proposed free trade agreement between 10 ASEAN member states and their six free trade agreement partners, and is scheduled to be signed in November this year. Meanwhile, the three countries are working closely to advance China, Japan and South Korea free trade agreement. Zhang Xiaogang, vice chairman of the China Council for the Promotion of International Trade, notes that the free trade agreement negotiations started in November 2012 and 60 rounds of meetings have been held so far. The free trade agreement negotiations are conducted almost simultaneously with the regional comprehensive economic partnership negotiations and the three countries reach a consensus that free trade agreement should be built on a regional comprehensive economic partnership agreement. To compare with RCEP, the CJK FTA should be higher in terms of level of liberalization and be broader in terms of coverage of sectors so as to reflect 
its own unique value. In this regard, there gives rise to a sequencing issue, namely, RCEP should conclude first, followed by CJKFTA. Since the RCEP negotiation will possibly come to the end this year, I'm quite convinced that the CJK will accelerate their pace of negotiation and hopefully pack up the agreement next year based on RCEP. Zhang says when the China-Japan-South Korea free trade agreement is established, the East Asia market will be further open and the three countries' cooperation will be further guarantee and comprehensive rule-based legal system. Japan and South Korea leaders congratulate Biden in victory election. Japanese Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga and South Korea's President Moon Jae-in congratulated Joe Biden for winning the United States presidential election and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris. Suga says he was looking forward to further strengthening the alliance between Japan and the United States, while Moon says he has great expectations of advancing their bilateral relations. Biden's victory in the battleground state of Pennsylvania put him over the threshold of 270 electoral college votes he needed to clinch the presidency, ending four days of nail-biting suspense and sending his supporters into the streets of major cities in celebration. Myanmar starts voting for general elections. Myanmar citizens turned out to cast their votes in the country's second general election since the end of military-backed rule, with the leader Aung San Suu Kyi widely expected to win another term. As a citizen, I don't think it's worth it to take the risk. We must take this risk in such crucial situation of our country's politics. I came here to cast my vote, as we must do it. I don't know much about the candidates. I have voted for the same party. I voted for in the previous election. As I believe the party can continue the change in the country. Why I go out and cast the vote at this time of risk due to the pandemic? It just to build my personal image and take citizens' responsibility. And I want to prove myself with my vote to be able to take part of country change. More than 37 million voters are registered to vote, but fear over the spread of the COVID-19 may dampen turnout. Voters arrive at the polling stations before polls open at 6 a.m. to form long queues by following rule of social distancing of Myanmar's health ministry. There are more than 5,000 voters in our polling stations in this place. We are all volunteers from different areas and do our best to follow the pandemic measures like social distancing or thermometer checks on people. I really hope the 2020 election will be done peacefully in the end, overcoming many challenges and problems in this time. Pool authorities and volunteers say it's difficult to socially distance hundreds of people, but are optimistic about getting polling done peacefully. China and India meet to hold a round of army commander level. The Chinese Ministry of National Defense says China and India held the eighth round of army commander level meeting in Chusul. The two sides had a candid and in-depth and constructive exchange of views on disengagement along the line of actual control in the western section of the China-India border. The Defense Ministry says that the both sides agreed to earnestly implement the important consensus reached by the leaders of the two countries, ensure their frontline troops to exercise restraint and avoid misunderstanding and miscalculation. According to the ministry, the two sides agreed to maintain dialogue and communication through military and diplomatic channels and push for the settlement of other outstanding issues on the basis of this meeting so as to jointly maintain peace and tranquility in the border areas. The Thailand's rebel protesters continue protests against government. More than 1,000 members of Thailand's lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender community and anti-government protesters join in a pride parade demanding equal rights and the removal of Prime Minister Prayut Chang Ocha and reforms to the monarchy. A protest movement that emerged in July has drawn a wide range of interest groups to push for a greater democracy and human rights in the Southeast Asian country. Wearing colorful outfits, lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender members march side by side with the mostly youth protesters dressed in black shirts. 
Protesters have initially demanded of removal of Prayut, a former junta leader, the accused of engineering last year's election to keep power. But demonstrations have also broken taboos by calling for curbs on King Mahavajira Longkorn's powers. Prayut says last year's election was fair and has refused to step down. The palace has made no official comment on the protest. The king says we love them all the same when asked to comment on the protesters. Japan Prime Minister wants to work with the new President of the United States. Japanese Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga says he wants to work with President-elect Joe Biden to strengthen the Japan and the United States alliance and to secure peace and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific region. I would like to once again congratulate Mr. Biden and Ms. Harris from the bottom of my heart. Suga also said nothing had been decided on the timing of phone talks with Biden or visit to the United States, and he wants to arrange them at the right time. Water cannons disperse Thailand protesters. Witnesses say Thailand police fire water cannons at the thousands of protesters who marched toward royal offices to deliver a demand for reform of the monarchy for King Mahavajira Longkorn. The protesters are blocked at a barricade of buses and barbed wire as they try to march from the Democracy Monument towards the Royal Household Bureau. Police fired water cannon to try to stop them, but some managed to get through to the area known as Sanam Luang next to the Grand Palace. A ban on protest on October 15 backfired when it drew tens of thousands of people onto the streets in anger. The protests since July have been the biggest challenge to the Thailand's establishment in years and have also prompted unprecedented criticism of the monarchy at Regent Thailand Royalist. The protesters brought boxes stuffed with letters for the king and left them near the palace with police agreement. The protesters seek to put the king more clearly under the constitution, reversing changes he made shortly after taking the throne and moves he made to take personal control of the palace for tune and some army units. Rizik Shihab returns to Indonesia after three-year exile on insulting state ideology. Thousands of supporters gather at Jakarta's airport to welcome back Rizik Shihab, a firebrand cleric and Islamist leader who went into exile in Saudi Arabia after facing charges over sending pornographic messages and insulting state ideology. There are chaotic scenes at the airport as his supporter dressed in white paralyzed the toll road, scrambling to get a glimpse of the cleric and even trying to kiss his hand. Some airlines are forced to reschedule flights. Rizik, who heads the Heartline Islamic Defenders Front, became a figurehead for conservative Islam and politically influential movement against Jakarta's former Christian governor, Basuki Chayapurnama, known as Ahok, who in 2017 was jailed for blasphemy for insulting Islam. The same year he faced charges himself being made a suspect on allegations of insulting Indonesian secular state ideology Pancasila and pornography. After a purported steamy exchange between Rizik and a supporter that included naked images of a woman was circulated online. The cleric left Indonesia in 2017 and police dropped both charges a year later, but he had remained in self-exile in Saudi Arabia until returning to Indonesia. World Dreamliner set sales from Singapore since COVID-19 restrictions. Thousands of passengers set sail from Singapore on a cruise to nowhere aboard the World Dreamliner for the first expedition since cruises were halted worldwide in March after travel restrictions kicked in, hit by major outbreaks of the coronavirus. The cruise, although allowed to operate, was quite different from the pre-pandemic times. Before boarding the ship, all passengers are tested for the coronavirus. All crew members working on the cruise ship have had to quarantine for 14 days and undergone six coronavirus tests. Uh, I think all our crew uh, would actually got to tap in and out uh, into various locations that when they, they work. Uh, they also have to practice social distancing. I think in, also in terms of cohort, they also be restricted. Uh, and every seven days, 
uh, all our crews will have to gone through an uh, antigen test. The cruise ship owned by the Hong Kong company Dream Cruiser will return to the Singapore after three days at sea with no port calls in between. The ship is also operating at no more 50% capacity. Other control and prevention measures such as regular and proper disinfection of the ship, installation of hand sanitizer stations and control on the amount of people allowed in the event venues and theatres have also been implemented. The cruise ship has also set up medical facilities for nucleic acid testing as well as 7 quarantine wards and 34 quarantine rooms. If any passenger is suspected of having COVID-19, the close contacts will be hosted in the quarantine rooms until the test result shows. The World Dreamliner set sail with nearly 1,400 passengers and nearly 1,000 crew members aboard. That's all for today. Have a great weekend with your friends and family. See you again.